just on paper, it looks like you, you start with the Seymour Agency in, in 2012, and then by 2016, just four years later, you're forming the Tobias Literary Agency. Yes, yes. That must have been a heck of, of a four years. What, uh, what did you learn at the Seymour Agency that set you up to then go on and, 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 and found your own successful agency? Everything. Um, Nicole Resiniti is amazing in every way. Um, we're still besties, talk all the time. I can call her up for anything. She calls me up. Um, we have some stuff together. Um, and yeah, she taught me everything, brought me around, introduced me to editors and, you know, walked me through the fire. And so when you start with the agency, are you, are you an intern? Do they make you an associate agency agent? Yes. I started off as a reader. Um, I saw, I don't know if it's an ad or maybe like a tweet from uh, Marissa Cleveland, who is one of the most amazing people in the universe, um, looking for a reader. And I said, hey, I could do that. I could read books for a living or for fun. Um, so it was an internship, you know, free, non-paid reading. Um, and then I worked my way up to literary assistant. And then I stuck there for probably longer than I should have because I was very nervous and scared about being an agent. And Nicole finally, finally convinced me and I was like, okay, I'll be an agent. What was uh, scary? I, mean, I know that obviously you have a great um, uh, respect for the, the role, but what, what made you nervous about the prospect of being one? Um, to be frank, I'm not a salesperson. I don't see myself a salesperson in any way, shape, or form. I got, I wouldn't say fired. I got let go from a sales job um, for being horrible at it. So I was thinking, how the hell am I going to sell books? But then, you know, I realized once you have the passion for something or you're in love with a book, I mean, all it is is telling someone about it, just pitching it. Whereas for me, I thought of sales as like what my brother does. You get on the phone, call random people. And for me, that sounds like a nightmare because I don't want to sell anyone something I don't believe in, which is why I got let go from my sales job. What were you, uh, what were you selling? I was working at the college bookstore and someone called and was like, how much is a school hoodie? And I was like, oh, it's $60. And the guy was like, oh, that's expensive. And I was like, yeah, man, that's capitalism. <laughs> and the <laughs> boss overheard and was like, oh, you should probably try to sell it. And I was like, oh, man. Okay, so like that night I talked to my girlfriend at the time and she was like, oh, well, you could have said it's school spirit and supporting the school. And I was like, I I'm not going to sell my soul for a piece of cloth that cost five cents and the school is selling for $60. Like I'd rather let go than, you know, make that pitch. Good for you. Um, so that makes that makes sense. So you um, you find a book you believe in it that makes that opens that up, and then it's not a question of selling your soul. You're a hundred percent invested. Yes, yes, and you know sometimes I'm not wrong, but books don't sell. And book I I tried to sell books that haven't sold, and I'm still really mad at those books not selling. And I think eventually they will sell if I go back if I have the chance to go back five years later, the book may sell like wildfire. And that's just the way that industry works. Like when I first started, I wanted to do horror all the way in, but publishing editors, they all said, no, no one wants horror. Horror doesn't sell well. There's only old white guys in the horror and that's all that'll ever sell. And I was like, oh, these people, they're missing out. They don't know what they're talking about. And then when Get Out came out, suddenly everyone wanted horror. And I was like, yes, I told you all. I told you so. Um, so and I had read, was it, uh, you were, you got your first sale well, at the Seymour Agency within about four or six months, somewhere uh, insanely early in the process? Yes. Um, 
I think it was to Harlequin Intrigue um, because Seymour Agency does a lot of romance. So I just happened to fall into a lot of romance. Um, so my first sale was to Harlequin Intrigue, um, romantic suspense. Um, and I think that was really, really, really early. Um, most agents I've learned, you know, their first sale is a year. And I think I just lucked out. I think it was just dumb luck, which is, you know, I hate to say a lot in the industry. It's timing and dumb luck. I mean, it's very frustrating, but honest. Yeah, yeah, it's really frustrating. Um, I've had books rejected because editors come back and say, oh, I just bought a similar book two weeks ago. I'm like, oh, mother. <laughs> I swear, <laughs> it was just like, oh man, time it. Uh, two weeks. I mean, if you had a, like, then you have to go back. Like, man, if I just submitted, you know, two weeks before, three weeks before, could it? Yeah. Could it be? <laughs> yep, exactly. And it's a kick in the stomach, but you know, what can you do? I had an agent way back when, when I was submitting, and she was my my dream agent. And she literally took on, uh, just before me, a book about a young boy who invents robots similar to Banneker Bones, and then a young adult novel about zombies. I was like, oh, come on. <laughs> yep. yep. That should yep. have been me a month earlier. Ah. <laughs> I'm telling you, it's just dumb luck. Yeah. So... With getting that first sale that early in, does that give you the confidence then to start more aggressively selling? How does that impact you and set you up for future success? Um, I think it's a double-edged sword because, you know, I have the imposter syndrome where I'm like, oh, man, that was just dumb luck. Dumb luck. That's not going to happen again. <laughs> so then, I mean, I, I think being doubted or even doubting yourself is great motivation to go hard um and that's what i did and it took a while just like i think most agents it takes a while um and then eventually you know once you get the swing of things and you've been in it for a few years you build a list of great authors you find great projects you sometimes you have to go out hunting for great projects um and then, you know, I think most people find the swing of it or they move on to other stuff. I mean, agenting, unless you're at one of the big mega corporations, it's not salary. I mean, you make, you earn a living off of what you sell. And in order to do that, you have to come from a certain privileged background. So, I mean, it's not an easy life or an easy job. Well, we heard about your, your sweet $5 per book uh, when you were eight. Um, would, you, would you describe yourself as coming from a privileged background? Uh, yeah, absolutely. Um, I mean, number one, I'm a cishet white dude. Number two, um, I come from a, I don't want to say wealthy family, but, you know, a family of doctors and lawyers and yada, yada, yada. So, I mean, I, I could work those however many years I did for free. I mean, obviously, I, I had a part-time job. I was a medical coder, which is the most mind-numbing jo mind job in the universe. Um, but, yeah, I definitely come from a privileged background. Absolutely. So, when you start at the Seymour, you're, you're coding in the background – part-time and then yep. uh, what's your week look like and you're working completely free with the hope yep. of your yep there's free wow. internship I, I i think that's how most or at least up until however long ago new york said you have to pay interns um and that's only in new york um but yeah it was free and i did it for the love of it and for the experience and with the goal of growing into some other type of role um, and it was absolutely worth it. And I would do it again. Um, but yeah, I was medical coding in the background. Um, 
And I, I mean, for me, I considered medical coding the side gig as opposed to, you know, reading and interning and all that. That was my full-time job. I didn't get paid and medical coding was the paying gig, but, you know, my heart laid in the industry. And you're, I mean, you're in New York City, right? Trying to pay rent during that time? No, not at all. Okay. I was living at home at that point because, you know, medical coding is not a fun job and it's not the best paying job. Um, but yeah. Okay. So medical coding, you're doing that most, most every day for what, like four hours a day and then you switch over to agenting or... Yeah, I, I mean, back then I wasn't an agent. I was the literary assistant intern and, you know, medical coding was basically my full-time job and assisting was my part-time job. But I think like most agents do now, you read queries when you can, when you have the time and the rest of the time you're working for your clients. So when do you get to the point where you can kiss medical coding goodbye? Or are you still doing that? <laughs> oh, hell no. I, I kissed them goodbye years ago. Um, I don't know. I think it depends for every agent. You know, the saying is you have to do it for five years before you see any profit. Um, and for me, that wasn't the experience. But again, I, I came from a very privileged background where if I wanted to do something full-time for free, I could have done that. And that leads me to believe, and I, I could be wrong, but that a, a majority of literary agents uh, are not cold calculated. Oh, five years from now, I'm going to get that, that sweet, sweet money. You know, I mean, they could be, they could be selling, drugs for the Sackler family there. They're focused on, on books and passion, right? Yes. I think most agents are for books and passion. Um, and I mean, I can't say everyone because there's a-holes out there like the Sacklers. Um, and, you know, some are all about that money. Some are all about that passion. And sometimes you have to be both. I mean, it's a business.